Thank you, it's good to be here. I'm gonna to talk today about deep fakes. It's probably a term you've heard about, um, but before I, I dive into deep fakes, I wanna just give you a little bit of history of uh, photo manipulation and media manipulation. And, and it is not something new. Um, and arguably, it's, we've been manipulating images and photographs as long as photography has been around. Stalin, for example, famously airbrushed people out of photos that fell out of favor. Um, but really, starting in the uh, 1990s, we started to see a revolution in digital imaging. And much of that has been driven by digital cameras, ubiquitous computing, and of course, programs like Adobe Photoshop, which have made it easier and easier to alter and manipulate photographs. And so in this 25 year period, we saw this rise of photo manipulation. Um, and in 2015, we started to be able to do some pretty fun things with photographs like this, uh, where for example, we would swap President Obama and Michelle Obama's face and relatively straightforward to do this uh, in a program like Photoshop. And we've also started to be able to manipulate videos in the mid 2000s and do things like this. I appreciate the tenor of the conversations. Uh, I think it will actually yield results uh, before the end of the year, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody. Good day, By around the mid-2000s, we've already started to see photo and video manipulation. In many cases, they were like the two last images and videos that I showed you, which is sort of fun. Um, we wanted to be able to uh, poke fun or have humor or spoof uh, presidents, for example. Um, but since 2015, we've started to see a new age of digital manipulation, and that's what we're going to talk about today, so-called deep fakes. So if you navigate to the website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, true to the name of that URL, you will be presented with a face of a person, well, who doesn't exist. Uh, so these six people that you see here were completely 100% synthesized by a computer algorithm. They don't exist, and you can see that they cover gender, race, age, facial hair, glasses, and computers can now whole cloth synthesize images and, as I'll show you in a little bit, video of people who don't exist or people doing things that they never did. And this is a bit of a game changer, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So let's talk about how this person does not exist works. So this is a so-called, these are created with a so-called GAN, a, a Generative Adversarial Network. And, and here's the basic workings of how it works. Up in the top, you start with a random image. And when I say random image, I literally mean you drop down a bunch of pixels into a, an image. And that um, goes into a generator. That's the generator's responsibility is to create the image of the person who doesn't exist. And so it takes that image of random pixels and it hands it to a discriminator. And the discriminator has access to images of, well, people, actual people. And the discriminator's job is to ask, can I distinguish that image provided to me from the generator from these images of actual people? And in this case, the answer is, of course, yes. And so it goes back to the generator and says, please try again. And the generator makes modifications to those pixels, sends it back to the discriminator, the discriminator checks again, and it does that millions and millions and millions of times in a very tight loop, very, very rapidly. And this is why it's called a generative adversarial network. Generative because it's making something, adversarial because you're pitting that generator with the discriminator, and network because the underlying mechanism for the generator and the discriminator is a so-called deep neural network. And when you run this simple mechanism in millions and millions of iterations, it will eventually create an image where the discriminator will look at and say, yep, I can't tell that this is not a person. And now you have this person does not exist. Now, we can do something a little bit different with this. We can change identities with the same basic underlying mechanism. So now, let's say I want to change one person's identity in the top left here to another person's identity, uh, let's say Steve Buscemi. So the generator's job is to modify pixels in the face hand that to the discriminator, and the discriminator's job is not, is this a person? The, the discriminator's job is now to ask, is this Steve Buscemi or whoever's identity you wanna swap? If the answer is no, it sends it back to the generator, and again, they work in a very tight loop until the generator makes modifications that the discriminator cannot detect. And then when you do that, frame after frame after frame in a video, you get something that looks a little bit like this. I expected Amy to win, so, I, I just like, it was just, I, this, was, this was very truly surprising for me. Uh. So what you're seeing on the left is the original video, Jennifer Lawrence, of course, accepting an award. And on the right is a so-called face swap deep fake, 
where on every frame, a GAN, a generative adversarial network, made the modifications that I was just talking about to replace Jennifer Lawrence's face with Steve Buscemi's face. And again, the power of this technology is that it is fully automatic. Um, you provide the content that you want as original source, you provide the images of the face you want to swap, and the computer takes over. So there's no Photoshop, there's no After Effects, there's none of the skilled labor that is typically required to do this. And so let's look at a couple of examples of the things that you might be able to do with this type of face swap deep fakes. She and Obama stole my microphone, they took it to Kenya. They took my microphone to Kenya and they broke it and now it's broken. And you hear that it's picking up somebody sniffing here. I think it's her sniffs. So, of course, that's Alec Baldwin on Saturday Night Live, and what we've done is replaced his face with that of President Trump's, and you can now see the power of this technology in the ability to make it look like one person is saying something or doing something they never did. Uh, let me show you just one more example. Listen, America, Donald Trump cannot be president. He would be a disaster, a failure, a complete F. In America, you deserve better than an F. So on November 8th, vote for me, and I promise I will be a stone cold B. So those are called so-called face swap deep fakes, where you've taken one actor or impersonator and you've replaced one face with another face. And you can see the power of that technology to impersonate a president, a candidate, a CEO, whomever you like. Now, this is a slightly different type of deep fake, and I just want to mention it because we're going to be talking about it a little bit in a, in a little bit. So let's go ahead and watch this and I'll explain what you're seeing. Now. You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Okay, so what you're seeing there is a fully authentic uh, video of President Obama, and, but what you're hearing is Jordan Peele. And the manipulation now is not replacing an entire face, but simply synthesizing the mouth to be consistent with a new audio track. And again, this is a very similar type of, the goal is very similar, which is to create an, a video of a person saying something they never did, but the underlying mechanism is slightly different because we take an original video and modify only the mouth and the, uh, the speech. These are so-called lip sync deep fakes. And so where, where do we worry about this type of technology? Obviously, lots of fun things you can do with it. They're highly humorous and for political commentary, but there's also a darker side to this technology. And where we are seeing the biggest harm today is in the form of non-consensual pornography, taking one person's likeness and inserting it into sexually explicit material and then distributing that on the internet. And that is probably today the, the most common use of deepfake technology, which again is yet another example of the weaponization of technology against women and something that I think we need to get a handle on. Uh, coming up into the 2020 elections here in the U.S., we are very concerned about misinformation campaigns in all forms, and one of them is in the creation of a video of a candidate saying something inappropriate or offensive and how that might affect an election. Um, obviously, in the courts, as we begin to rely more and more on digital evidence, um, can we trust body cam footage? Can we trust surveillance footage? Can we trust uh, footage taken from an iPhone if that footage can be manipulated? How do we get our handle on evidence in courts of law? There are huge national security implications when we rely on video of events happening around the world to make life-altering global decisions. And of course, in the form of fraud. So what happens, for example, when I create a video of Mark Zuckerberg saying that profits are down 10%, I leak that on the internet, I can, uh, I can manipulate the stock market to the tune of billions of dollars before anybody else figures out that it's fake. So when you have the ability to make people say and do things that they never did, you can see that you have this long list of potential threats. And the things that we wanna think about are now, how do we protect against that? from a policy perspective, from a legal perspective, from, a, from an education perspective, and from my world, from the technology side. And what I'm gonna talk about next are some of the technologies that we are, are developing in order to detect these types of deep fakes so we can protect ourselves against a long list of potential threats. Let me start by way of motivation. I'm gonna show you a series of clips of President Obama and, and just pay attention and see if you notice anything, yeah? Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. So those are all separate clips of President Obama at the beginning of his weekly address. 
And what you probably noticed is that whenever he said, hi, everybody, he tilted his head up and to his right. So hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. And what you may not have noticed, but you can see it on this frame right here, is that when he comes down, he purses his lips and he begins, he starts talking. And it's really consistent. He does this over and over and over again. And it's, it's sort of like a tell, a mannerism, a behavioral tick that he has. And we all have it. The way I raise my eyebrow when I emphasize something, for example, or the way I, I turn my head uh, when I talk. Um, and we're going to use those mannerisms to try to detect deep fakes. So let me show you an example of that. So what I'm showing you in the top row is one frame of an authentic Obama video. And that graph that you see is showing two things. Along the horizontal axis is time. That's about 10 seconds of video. And on the vertical axis, I'm showing you two motions that he makes. One in blue is how he rotates his head up and down uh, along the horizontal axis. And in orange is how he turns down the sides of his mouth as if he's frowning. And these are computed average over, over hours and hours of video of President Obama speaking. And what do you notice? They're correlated. So when he turns his head down, he tends to frown, or when he frowns, he tends to turn his head down, and vice versa. And you notice this when President Obama speaks, when he's delivering bad news, sad news, when he's upset, when he's angry, he tends to frown, and his head turns down ever so little. It's, it's a tell, it's a mannerism, it's a tick, if you will. Now below what you're seeing is a lip sync deep fake, similar to the Jordan Peele video that I showed you earlier. And what do you notice here is that they're decoupled. Well, why is that? Well, in this video, the mouth is saying something, whatever the impersonator wants him to say, but the, the head is saying something else. The head doesn't know what the mouth is saying, and so we've decoupled and we've disrupted the mannerism that is typical of the way President Obama speaks. Now, that's President Obama's mannerism. That's his tell, that's his tick. Other people have different ones. So here, for example, is President Trump on the top, um, and now the blue corresponds to the chin pucker, and the orange corresponds to how wide the mouth is. And you see here that they are decorrelated. So when he does that chin pucker, his mouth is closed and vice versa. On the bottom row is Alec Baldwin, who does a very funny impersonation on Saturday Night Live. And here you can see that those two mannerisms are now coupled, they're correlated. So Alec Baldwin took two ticks of President Trump, the chin pucker and the mouth open, and he created a caricature of it, but he did it wrong. He got the dynamics of it wrong. And so we can use that to detect that something is wrong with the video. Okay? And everybody's different. Elizabeth Warren, Hillary Clinton, President Trump, President Obama, Vice President Biden, they all have different mannerisms. And what we do is we learn them. And we learn them by looking at hours of video of each of these individuals, extracting those patterns, and then using that to identify whether somebody's impersonating them through a deep fake. So let me show you just very quickly how we do that. So we start with the video and we do some basic head and face tracking. So that blue box you're seeing is telling me the three-dimensional rotation of President Obama's head as he speaks. The green lasers coming out of the eyes are telling me where he's looking and all the dots on the face are tracking his facial expressions. We take all of that information and we extract 190 measurements, which I won't talk in detail about. And now I'm going to project those onto a two-dimensional space just so you can visualize them. So each dot in this, in this uh, graph here is corresponding to a 10 second video clip of uh, Kamala Harris, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and so on and so forth. These were obviously done at the height of the Democratic uh, primary. And you notice a couple of things. One is everybody's off in their own corner. So all of the Obama videos are distinct from the Trump videos, which are distinct, distinct from the Elizabeth Warren uh, videos. And so what that means is that when we now get a new video, we project it into the space and we simply ask, well, does this have the characteristics of uh, Vice President Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris, and so on and so forth. And then we can detect whether something is a deep fake or an impersonation. So that's one technique that we've developed. And you can see that it's very specific to an individual, very good for high profile people like candidates but not so good for, well, people like me, where you don't have hours and hours of video footage where you can measure my various mannerisms. So this is good for doing things like protecting our uh, elections, but not so good for the day-to-day run-of-the-mill uh, people, people like me. So let's talk about another technique that we're developing. So uh, what I'm showing you on this graph, on this figure rather, is a mapping between phonemes, the sounds that you make, and visemes, which is the shape of your mouth. So let's look in the bottom left-hand corner, MBP mother, brother, parent. Try saying this at home. Try saying mother and notice that your mouth has to close. 
And now try saying it without closing your mouth. Try saying mother. Not, and if you're a ventriloquist, you'll be able to do this. Everybody else, you will sound like you can, you're not enunciating the word properly. My other favorite one is F and V in the top uh, uh, row. Favor, Victor. Your lower lip curves in ever so slightly and your top teeth come down. Favor and Victor. Um, so when you make certain sounds, your mouth has to ha have a certain shape. This is the phoneme to viseme mapping. And when we create things like lip sync deep fakes, those mechanisms, that GAN that I told you about earlier, the generative adversarial network, doesn't know anything about phonemes. It doesn't know anything about visemes. All it knows is about pixels and these classifiers. And so we can leverage that ignorance in order to determine whether the mouth is making the proper shape to, say, a particular phoneme. So let me give you a couple examples of that. So what I'm going to show you here is a slow motion version of President Trump saying, I'm, I am. Okay, so let's go ahead and watch that video. Good. So you see him saying, I'm, and I'm going to just show you it in frame by frame so you can see what happens to his mouth. So frame one of six, two of six, three of six, four of six, five of six, and six of six. And now his mouth is entirely closed. I'm. There's that M phoneme, and then the viseme is correct. So this is an authentic uh, clip. Let me show you now uh, a segment of a lip sync deep fake where, again, he's saying, I'm, and you're going to hear the beginning of the next word. So you're going to see, I'm so. I'm so, and I'm going to put in that S so you can see I'm closing off the phoneme M. So let's go ahead and watch this. Okay, now let's do it in slow motion again. One of four, two of four, three of four, four of four. So I'm so, and you can see his mouth never closed. And if his mouth never closed, something is almost certainly wrong because it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to say mo mother, I'm, without closing your mouth. And so what we've been doing is building models of these phoneme visi matchings, uh, pairings rather, and then going back in and making sure that the mouth has the proper shape and exposing things like lip sync deep fakes, which are simply ignorant of these types of uh, mappings because of the nature of the way GANs work. So I've described two techniques that we've developed uh, for detecting deep fakes, and I've described the threat of deep fakes, and I've described how deep fakes are made. And if you invite me back next year, almost certainly everything will have changed. Uh, the nature of the creation of deep fakes, the risk of deep fakes, and the detection of deep fakes is changing. It is a fast moving field, and we have to start thinking seriously and carefully about the threat of misinformation. We are living through an unprecedented time where we are relying more and more on the internet for information, for information that affects our health our societies, our democracies, and our economies. And when we can't trust the media that we see, hear, and read on a daily basis, we are in trouble as a society and we are in trouble as a democracy. And I, while I focused on the technology, we also have to get serious about the policies. We have to get serious about the regulation. The tech companies that allow this, this misinformation and disinformation to proliferate through their networks have to get more serious about how their, their platforms are being weaponized. Our regulators have to get more serious about how to get control over mis- and disinformation that is designed to sow civil unrest, uh, tear societies apart, and disrupt our democracies. And we have to do all of that, by the way, quickly and with respecting freedom of expression and freedom of speech and a vigorous debate online about people who disagree. And I think that there is a middle ground there, but we have gone too far in one direction where we simply can't trust anymore what we see, hear, and read online. And we need to regain some trust in order to have a sound democracy, society, and economy. Thanks very much, everybody.